You know, I just thought, is it this familiar? What? This. You and me, sitting here, stomach growling, waiting to eat. Because of the cocktail hour. Because of Jigger. It wasn't always Jigger. Most of the time it was. Just as we were about to eat, Jigger would call to say he was at some game or something. Sometimes. All the time. So you dig into another one of your Albert Pace and Turner Hill dog books, and Mother and Pop would have another drink and talk about their day, while I just sit here stewing. Well, that's your problem. Well, it was the maid's problem, too, remember? Mother would say, give us five more minutes, but it would be an hour before Jigger would show up and mother and pop would stagger from the couch and stumble into the dining room. But how did those poor souls put up with us night after night? It's amazing that one of them didn't appear in the doorway some night with a machine gun and just mow us all down. Honestly, John, we were good to everyone who worked for us. We'd always go in the kitchen and make a huge fuss. Oh, sure and cage an extra cookie while the poor things frantically tried to clean up. Oh, God. What shits we were about maids. We drove them to church. We paid their medical bills. <laughs> we were shits. When grandmother died, she left $500 to each of the three maids that had taken care of her all her life and the path her to the chauffeur. Mother made it up to them. Oh, sure. She tried and they tried to make it up to themselves along the way. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you that every dinner party, every cocktail hour, good Lord, every civilized endeavor in this world is based on exploiting the poor Cheryl Marie's of this world? Her name is Shirley Marie, I think. <laughs> and anyway, she's exploiting us. There you go. Now we're exploiting each other. You know, Pop always carries on about the importance of civilized life. But has it ever occurred to you what it takes to achieve it? Between what Freud tells us we do to ourselves and what Marx tells us we do to each other, it's a wonder we don't call up our own assholes. <laughs> Nicely put, John. <laughs> All I know is, according to your good wife, Ellen, whenever you and she give a party in New York, you're the first one to hire some poor, out-of-work actor to serve the soup. Yeah, I know. It's a shitty system, but I can't think of a better one. I think you're a shit, John. I'll say that much, at least. What else is new? No, I mean now, tonight, for this. For this? Coming up here and stirring things up with your play. This is probably one of the most decent things I've ever done. <laughs> Badgering two old people, threatening them with some ghastly kind of exposure in the last years of their lives. I came here to get their permission. You came here to stir things up, John. You came here to start trouble. That's what you've done since the day you were born, and that's what you'll do till you die. You can't just leave people alone, can you? Why don't you at least be constructive about it and tease the mafia or the CIA for God's sakes? Because I'm not a political person. Then what kind of person are you, John? Why are you so passionately concerned with disturbing the peace? I mean, here we are, the family at least partially together for the first time in years, and probably for the last time in our lives. And what do you do? You torment us with this play. You accuse us of running a slave market in the kitchen. You all make us feel thoroughly <coughs> uncomfortable. You ever think about this, John? Yes. Well, good. I'm so glad. You ever wonder why that is? Because there's a hell of a lot of horse shit around, and I think I've known it from the beginning. <laughs> Do you care to try chapter and verse? Sure. Horse shit begins at home. <laughs> <laughs> He's a wonderful man. He's a hypocrite, kiddo. He's fake. Talk about manners and class and social obligation. He's a poor boy who married a rich girl and doesn't want to be called on it. Now that's a lie. He was only poor after his father died. 
Yes. Well, all that crap about hard work and notes to the grindstone and burn the midnight oil. What is all that crap? Have you ever seen it in an operation? Whenever I tried to call him at the office, he was out playing golf. He's done extremely well in business. He sent us to private schools and first-rate colleges. Oh, I know he's done well on charm, affability, and mother's money, and a little help from his friends. His friends have carried him all his life. They're the ones who've thrown him the deals. Whenever you try to ask him a financial question, he'll say, wait a minute, I'll call Bill, or Bob, or Ted. Because that's life, John. That's what business is. The golf course, the backgammon table at the midday club, the Saturn Club grill at six, that's where he works, you jerk. Well, that's where his family is, not here. Has he ever shown you how to throw a ball or dive into a pool? Not him. He's never been my father, and I've never been his son. And he and I have known that for a long time. Well, he's been a wonderful father to me. Maybe so. And maybe to Jacob. Yeah. I guess that's why I teased the both of you all my life. And everybody else for that matter. I'm jealous. I'm jealous of anybody who's had a leg up all night. Anybody who's had a father in the background helping them out. Hell, I, I even teased my own children. I've bent over backwards to be to them what my father never was to me. And out of some deep grain jealousy that they have it too good, I teased the pants off of them. Jesus, John, you're a mess. I know, but I'd be even more of one if I didn't write about it. Well, write as much as you want, but don't go public on this one. I've already said I would. I'm not sure I believe you, John. You're too angry. You'll change a few words, a few names, and out it will come. Nina, I promise... Then why is the money still here? Mother told me about the money, and there it is. How come? I don't want it. Take it. Take it just so I'll be sure. I know you're man enough not to do it if you take the dough. I'll never cash it. I don't care. But it's yours now. And it stays in your desk drawer now until they're both dead. And until I'm dead, goddammit. Or until he changes his mind. Fair enough. You know, Nina, I'm kind of glad it's not going on. Why? Because to tell you the truth, I haven't got the plot right just yet. What's wrong with that? I don't know. It's not right yet. It's not true yet. There's a secret in it somewhere. What secret? Yes, well, I'd love to know what I did to have him say to himself and to me. This is not my son. I don't know this boy. Because he said it to me as long as I could remember. And if he ever told you he loved you, you'd immediately do some totally irritating thing to make him deny it. You think so? You would. If he killed the fatted calf, you'd complain about the cholesterol. <laughs> Jesus. You would. I got your number, John, even if you don't have mine. For instance, I know why you're writing this goddamn play. You're writing it because he's dying. You're writing it because you love him. You're writing it to hold on to him after he's gone. <laughs> 